Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar on cross-examination by Justice Pradeep Nandagyur, sir. Uh, like the last session was wonderful, and uh, this session would be highly anticipated, and we're looking forward for this. So without any further ado, I would uh, request uh, Sudhakar Yalagar, sir, who is the Joint Director for Martial Arts Academy. Please welcome Nandraj uh, Yog, sir to start the session. So good, good morning, uh, Lordship. Good morning, Chetan. Thank you, Chetan. Uh, good morning to all uh, honorable Lordships, our honorable Chief Justice, uh, Director, uh, and uh, our honorable P principal judges, my brothers and sister judges from all over India, uh, Sri Lanka, and other countries. Uh, today, we are going to have a webinar on this cross examination by honorable Chief Justice Pradeep Nandrajo former Chief Justice of Rajasthan and Bombay High Courts. Uh, this is the second one. We have already, we already had one webinar by his Lordship. Therefore, with, a, with an intention to have more time for the lecture and the discussion, uh, please uh, forgive me for skipping the more detailed introduction. So Lordship, you are welcome to this uh, webinar and to our academy, Maharashtra Judicial Academy, uh, which is being organized in collaboration with the SEC Online and Eastern Book Company. Well, once again, welcome and I hand over the session to your honor, sir. Good morning, everybody. I hope uh, you, your friends, your family members are fine in these uh, very tiring and trying last two months which we had. I had been um, reflecting on the past during the lockdown period and I posited the question to myself as to what went wrong with us, what went wrong in life. As I walked the path of the past and reflected upon my life and uh, life of others, life of society in general, I realized that the problem was that what we learned in the kindergarten was forgotten by the society, was forgotten by me as well. We did not implement what we learned in kindergarten. I also realized that knowledge does not live at the top of the mountain peak of the graduation school. It lies there in the sandpit of the kindergarten. What did we learn? I've just penned it down. I read. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say sorry when you hurt someone. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush the toilet after you used it. Live a balanced life. When you go out in the world, Look out for traffic, hold hands and stick together. Help the needy, if not with money, a smile shall suffice. The pandemic of Corona teaches us that had we lived by the tenants of what was learnt in the kindergarten. Don't take more than what you need. Share things with others. Live a balanced life. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush the toilet after you've used. And help the needy. What more? Everything one needs to know is there in the sandpit of kindergarten. 
the golden rule of living love basic sanitation ecology politics equality and above all sane living but what is the relevance of what i have just now uttered to the topic for today cross examination well i learned my cross examination in my kindergarten so did you but you forgot remember the nursery rhyme johnny johnny yes papa eating sugar no papa telling lies no papa open your mouth ha ah, ha ah. what a beautiful illustration of cross examination papa had to lead johnny to open his mouth and when he led johnny to the stage when johnny was compelled to open his mouth the truth emerged indeed johnny had eaten sugar sir james stephens the celebrated author of the treatise on the law of evidence wrote concerning cross examination and to quote he said cross examination the rarest and the most useful and the most difficult to acquire of all the accomplishments of the advocate it has always been deemed the surest test of truth and a better security than the solemn oath which the witnesses take before they depose in a court of law no cause reaches the stage of litigation unless there are two sides to it so witnesses on one side deny or qualify the statements made by those on the other side if only witnesses stand by the solemn oath i swear to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth a judge would have no problem in deciding which side is telling the truth but witnesses don't say that nobody tells the whole truth so the only means is cross examination no substitute has been found as a means of separating truth from fabrication or reducing exaggerated statements to their true dimensions as a stephen said cross examination is generally considered to be the most difficult branch of the multifarious duties of an advocate one has to deal with a prodigious variety of witnesses testifying under an infinite number of different circumstances involving all shades and complexions of human morals human passion human intelligence and therefore cross examination is always reduced to a duel between the witness who is in the witness box and the lawyer who is cross examining the witness cross examination requires great ingenuity a habit of logical thought clearness of perception and the power to read minds intuitively and to appreciate motives 
behind statements made by witnesses under oath. The legislative framework in India pertaining to cross-examination is to be found in sections 145 to 156 of the Evidence Act and <coughs> succinctly put, cross-examination is directed towards two things. First, to discredit the testimony of the witness and second, to impeach the credit of the witness. There are some guiding principles. Whether you are discrediting the testimony of the witness or you are discrediting the credit of the witness, <laughs> leading and suggestive questions can be put during cross-examination. You can confront witnesses with their previous statements and their previous conduct. You can ask questions to discover who the witness is and what is his position in life. You can also ask questions to injure the character of the witness. But questions have to be relevant, directed towards whether the witness is a partisan witness. <coughs> is he an interested witness? or a tutored witness and all questions which would tend to discredit the witness or his testimony. These are very wide. We shall get into the specifics as I proceed on. Since I'm addressing honorable and learned judges, it becomes important for them to understand that cross-examination needs to be controlled and the provisions which empower the trier of the fact to control cross-examination are sections 148, 151 and 152 of the Indian Evidence Act. It empowers the court to control cross-examination and what is important is that firstly, the judge must ensure that if the tenure of the cross-examination is proceeding to discredit the testimony of the witness, the questions in cross-examination must be relevant to the facts in issue. And of course, if the tenure of the cross-examination is to impeach the creditworthiness of the witness, then of course the questions obviously by their nature would not be with respect to the facts which are relevant at the trial. All other questions have to be disallowed. Therefore, to summarize, one, questions not relevant to the proceedings are to be disallowed except where the credit of the witness is questioned. Secondly, in both circumstances, indecent, scandalous, intended to insult or annoy the witness have to be prohibited by the judge. It is extremely important once again to keep in mind, and I may sound like the needle of a gramophone which has got stuck because I'm repeating it for the third time, but I have to do that to drill it right in the marked distinction between one, discrediting the testimony and two, discrediting the witness must be kept in mind. So here we branch into the more specifics of the art of cross-examination directed towards 
discrediting the testimony or discrediting the credibility of the witness himself. On the issue of uh, directing the testimony to discredit the testimony of the witness, the first inquiry to be done by the cross examiner is, has the witness testified something that is materially against his party? That is to say, has the witness said something which has injured his side of the case? If the witness has deposed facts which are materially against his client, then one has to see whether the witness has made an honest mistake or has committed perjury. See, the pyramid has started now flowing. Nothing could be more absurd or a greater waste of precious judicial time in a court than to cross-examine a witness who has testified no material fact against you. It requires but little experience in courts to arrive at the conclusion that a great majority of cases are comprised of a few principal facts surrounded by a host of minor ones and the strength of the case of either side depends not so much upon the direct testimony relating to the facts in issue but which may be also called as the principal facts but tersely put upon the support given to them by the probabilities created by establishing and developing the relation of minor facts to the principal facts. As a lawyer, I had dealt with a case where the suit was very, very simple. It was based on an oral agreement admitted by both sides where the defendant had sold to the plaintiff a large stock of mining material and the variance between the two was whereas the plaintiff asserted that this sale was coupled with a guarantee by the defendant against the loss and therefore there was an oral further agreement that if within three years the plaintiff is unable to sell the stock, the defendant would purchase it at the sale price plus 10 percent. The only issue in the case was the single question. Who was correct in the memory of the conversation that had occurred three years ago. The plaintiffs swore that the defendant had agreed to repurchase the stock if the plaintiff could not sell the stock within three years and the price would be 10% above the price at which the plaintiff paid for the acquisition of the stock to the defendant. Of course, the defendant denied. The direct evidence was yes and no, which hardly took half a minute of the court's time. But the surrounding circumstances, the countless straws pointing to the probabilities on the one side and other occupied full three days and believe you, no time was wasted. Circumstances which at first blush appeared light, valueless, even disconnected, 
but skillfully handle united together to form wedges which could drive conviction into the mind were attempted to be proved by the two sides. I remember distinctly that so curious became the judge because the trial became like a spy thriller. I learned that at a trial, it becomes essential to join the judge to give him a fact of belief that the judge is an exalted Sherlock Holmes and therefore a keen observer to render a verdict which may be applauded. I was for the plaintiff. What kind of evidence I led? Anyone would say it is irrelevant, but it was strong supportive evidence to sustain the plaintiff's claim that there was an agreement for my back. So I led evidence to prove past credits advanced into see the parties. And let me tell you, the two gentlemen were men of high integrity and high reputation in society. So I led evidence of past credit advanced into see the parties to infer therefrom that how the two were managing their cash flows. I led evidence to establish that the defendant had a huge stock of unsold inventory. I led evidence to establish that the market was sluggish. I led evidence to establish that the defendant's bank credit limits had been exhausted. I led evidence that repeated attempts by the defendants to offload the material in the market had failed. And you could understand by instinct that from all the cornucopia of this five categories of supportive evidence, I was attempting to prove that no prudent reasonable trader would purchase the stock at the sale price and that the underlying signature tune had to be an agreement to immediately bail out the defendant to place in his hands cash and with an agreement that the defendant would repurchase the stock if within three years I could not sell the same. Now, what kind of evidence the defendant led? He led evidence that the plaintiff was a trader in commodities to prove that the plaintiff had in the past conducted what was apparently business, but actually he was purchasing risks. He was purchasing risk. He led evidence that in the past, the plaintiff used to lend on credit with pledge of goods. So he wanted to prove from this kind of testimony that the wedges which he builds would discredit the case of the plaintiff. You would be curious to know what happened at the end, the judge got extremely, extremely annoyed because after the testimony was over, he said, start arguing your final arguments. We told the judge that give us about a week to prepare. He said, fine. Within that one week, the lawyer on the other side became unwell. He had a serious disease. The case was postponed by another three months and the son of the plaintiff had fallen in love with the son, with the daughter of the defendant. The two got married and the two gentlemen, because of the matrimonial alliance between the children, settled their dispute. So this illustrative example would throw light on the fact that 
circumstances which at first blush appear to be inconsequential become relevant and when cross examination is being done if a judge finds prima facie that what is being put as questions in cross examination do not have any direct bearing on the case he should ask the party to explain the relevance by telling the witness to go out and if the lawyer is able to show the relevance then the cross examination must be permitted now let's get into something more specific there are two fundamental norms of cross examination ask leading questions to the witness where the answer has to be a yes or a no for otherwise if you ask open ended questions the answers would be such that you would be compelled to put more questions and then what would happen would be that the witness would start leading you and not you leading the witness never ask open ended questions always ask questions the response of which would be yes or no and the second one very very important do not ask a question the answer of which even you don't know the witness may give an answer which would perplex you more then the witness getting perplexed and you would be left clueless as the cross examination cross examine so with these two fundamental premises kept in mind we would now go into how to cross examine witnesses now witnesses can be put into different categories witnesses who are truthful and candid you have to even cross examine truthful and candid witnesses how to cross examine perjured witnesses and you would find that perjured witnesses would also form two subcategories and the second of the two subcategories would then form two further subcategories i shall highlight it as i proceed with my talk today and lastly how to cross examine expert witnesses so the cost of repetition since it is important how to cross examine truthful and candid witnesses how to cross examine perjured witnesses how to cross examine expert witnesses now the cross examiner has to master all the relevant facts and the facts in issue so before you start cross examination every relevant fact every fact in issue deposed to by the witness has to be memorized by you it has to be at the back of your palm for only then would you know where and how to trap a witness note carefully what has been testified by the witness which constitutes the material against you and how the same is likely to injure your side of the case i had already said that i'm weaving this in to the cross examination of the three categories of the witness if the witness is truthful and candid no point to beat about the bush if you do so you would then give an handle to the judge to simply write that in spite of lengthy cross examination nothing has been shown to me to break the witness and then the judge would 
take each and every word spoken of by the witness in testimony to be correct and would use it against you. One needs to move with caution while dealing with truthful and candid witnesses. What do you have to do? Put questions where the answers are such that it appears to the judge that a witness could tell a good deal more if he wanted to and leave it at that. Just leave it at that. Why? It builds the argument then that had the witness deposed fully, he would have been compelled to depose certain facts which would be against the interest of the party who has called him as the witness and in favor of your party. So I just crystallize. Honest and candid witnesses should only be put such questions where some answers come suggestive of that the witness knew something more. Don't extract anything more because the witness would clarify on the looseness of his language. As it is said, he who knows not the reason for a norm knows not the norm. What is the reason behind this line of cross-examination to be adopted for candid and truthful witnesses? The reason is that witnesses who support the case of their party as a rule do not reflect upon their meager opportunities for observing all the facts and rarely suspect the frailty of the power of their observation. Further, people generally believe that they accept their mistake, it would be discrediting them. This is the theory behind this line of cross-examination to be adopted. Benjamin F. F. Butler, Rufus Kohat, Judah P. Benjamin, Sir James Scarlett, and Lord Ebringer had the reputation of lethal cross-examiners of honest and truthful witnesses. They outstripped all other advocates not by yards, but by miles. It is said about them, and I quote, the gentlemanly ease, the polished courtesy, and the Christian urbanity and affection with which they proceeded the task did infinite mischief to the truthful witnesses upon whom they found it expedient to fasten a suspicion. Time is less. I cannot start explaining the manner in which these gentlemen did so, but I would recommend to view the trials conducted by these gentlemen at www dot trial theater dot com. I repeat www dot trial theater dot com and the T of the trial and the T of the theater being capital less letters in small font and trial and theater as one co joint word. How to cross examine perjured witnesses. As I said, they would form in two categories and the second category forming two further subcategories. Now you would find that perjured witnesses are of two kinds. 
the person who has to cross examine a perjured witness must first understand as to in which category the perjured witness is to be put first are those who cook up some facts but with an honest belief that the cooked up facts is true and the second is causes plain liars category a is a result of a witness having seen parts and heard about another part called upon with a considerable time lag between the occurrence of an event which the witness saw and deposes to and the testimony in court finding himself suddenly to be called upon to recapitulate the events the witness attempts to recall his original impression and, and as a result amplifies his story with non existing details on the belief that the more detailed is the story more is the credit of the storyteller thus he leads himself or is instinctively led to believe our recollections and which he finally swears to be the facts although perfectly honest in intention such witnesses are apt in consequence to complete their story by recourse to either imagination or something told to them regarding what they saw and observed by somebody else under the fear that i don't know answer will be attributed to ignorance on their part and thereby probably an inference to be drawn that the witness doesn't know the whole truth or is not telling the whole truth they entangle facts with beliefs and inferences i would like to give an example here i dealt with a case in the division bench where the case of the prosecution was that three assailants had assaulted the deceased and the three assailants were armed with a knife each four witnesses were the star witnesses of the prosecution the first witness depose that all four were sitting at a tea stall near the place where the crime took place there on a tea suddenly they heard commotion the place where the sounds were emanating attracted their attention and he said that they saw these four people assault the deceased they stabbed and then he said two ran in this direction two ran in that direction and then he said i chased them now see when he spoke in the plural any cross examiner could have got when he said two ran in one direction two ran in the other direction he could obviously chase all four he could only chase two and then he said i chased them and i chased them and then i came back we arranged for an auto rickshaw by the time somebody had informed the police the pcr van came and picked up the injured and as per the pcr there were only two witnesses there the second witness deposed that he saw four assailants he saw this injured falling down and he said i ran to get the scooter the third and the fourth witness said they comforted the injured on cross examination the first witness could give graphic details about two of the assailants as to what shirts they were wearing what colored pants they were wearing their height and so on so forth the others couldn't the trial court judge 
mess up the judgment or he reached the correct conclusions. But only if he had done that, that look what had happened. When four people saw somebody being attacked, one out of the four ran towards the assailants. The other three said, well, he's chasing them. It's pointless for we to chase them. One said, oh, let me go and get a rescue vehicle. So his attention got drawn to the rescue vehicle. Two said, let's comfort him. Now what had happened was, the second, third and the fourth <coughs> only deposed to limited facts. The first heard the story of the second and third and the fourth and envoomed it into his story. But with a little intelligence, you could have understood that each one was deposing to a facet of the transaction because the transaction was of a kind where somebody had to chase the accused, somebody had to get the rescue vehicle, somebody had to comfort the injured. Now, here was a case of truthful and an honest witness, but a witness who made a mesh of what he was told by the other witnesses soon after the incident. So he ascribed to himself the role of getting a scooter. He ascribed to himself the role of even comforting the injured, which are not true facts. But he wasn't a liar. Now, plain liars. They are obviously tutored witnesses. It is far more difficult task of exposing such witnesses because the witness knows that he is planted with an intentional fraud. This category of witnesses can be put into two subcategories. Witnesses of low grade intelligence, witnesses of superior intelligence, the former category can be easily identified because they show palpable nervousness in their voice, vacant expression of the eyes, in a nervous twisting about while deposing, apparent efforts to recall to the mind the exact wording of the story and especially in the use of language not suited to their station in life. The cross-examination examiner should maintain a constant eye contact with such witnesses. Best way to start cross-examination is to ask the witness to repeat his version. And one would note that the witness repeats in an almost identical manner using same words showing he has learnt it by rote. To this witness, as to the witness of those who depose truthfully but intermingle certain facts on their honest belief, questions by way of suggestions of facts may be false, which are entirely dissociated with the story should be put. These two categories of witnesses are unprepared for these new inquiries and will draw upon their imagination for the answers. The witnesses would be demolished. The witness of the second category of the perjured witnesses, the ones who tell plain truth, are hard nuts to crack because they are clever. The cross examiner has only one weapon. Do not cross examine such witnesses along the line of their story because they are clever. They have mugged up their story very well. Cross examine such witnesses at random. You as judges would have come across cross examinations which apparently would irritate you because you would find the witness being cross-examined at random. A good cross-examiner has no weapon other than 
to cross-examine intelligent plain liars, but at random. Why? Because they mugged up their story. So if you cross-examine them in the sequence of their story, they would be cleverly answering your questions. So you have to cross-examine them at random. Start with the mid part of their testimony, followed by part end, jump to the last leg of the first, followed by another limb of the end, and then the middle, and so on. The witnesses who are clever and are tutored would not be expecting questions at random to the various facets of their story, and such witnesses who deposed to by rote during examination in chief have been made to rehearse repeatedly and their mind is glued to the narrative as told and as memorized. They get confused if they are cross-examined at random. Sergeant Sullivan and Sergeant Armstrong in Ireland were masters of this technique of cross-examination and I once again recommend to you the same site website which I had spoke about earlier, www.trialtheatre.com. You would find beautiful trials and cross-examination by these two Irish gentlemen in respect of perjured witnesses of both categories, those who were apparently honest, but were made and compelled to intermingle certain facts on their belief. Cross-examination of perjured witnesses of low intellectual caliber and cross-examination of witnesses of a high intellectual caliber, that is clever witnesses. I'm now left with the third category of witnesses that are expert witnesses. Now you would understand that an expert witness is always deposes to a matter of knowledge accepted by the peers in the field of the subject to which the knowledge relates to as a specialized knowledge. The problem with skilled witnesses is they come with such a bias in their mind to support the cause in which they are embarked that hardly any weight needs to be given to their evidence, said Lord Campbell. You as judges would have seen whether it is handwriting, whether it is thumb impression, whether it is any kind of expert evidence, both parties get their experts uh, deposing diametrically opposite to each other. And the reason is what Lord Campbell said. In his treatise on the law of evidence, Taylor said, and I quote, expert witnesses become so warped in their judgment by regarding the subject in one point of view that even when consciously deposing, they are incapable of expressing a candid opinion. But the fact still remains that the testimony of expert witnesses is a regular feature in courts. It is a matter of common observation that not only can the honest opinion of different experts be obtained upon opposite sides of the same question, but also that dishonest opinions may be obtained upon different sides of the same question. While cross-examining an expert witness, a distinction must be kept in mind with or with two types of expert testimony. Testimony on matters of fact, testimony on matters of opinion. So for example, a medical expert may only state medical facts and not his opinion. He may say that when I examined the patient, the pulse was so much I recorded it. 
the temperature was so much. The breath rate was so much and he leaves it at that. He doesn't say that because the temperature was 101, it corroborates with my pulse, the pulse being 92, because as we all know, higher is the temperature, higher was the pulse, and as higher was the pulse, more is the heartbeat, and more is the oxygen required by the heart. He doesn't depose to his opinion, he just deposes to these facts. So witness may just first depose to facts, keep that into account, then he would depose to his opinion. As a general rule, it is unwise for the cross examiner to attempt to grapple with a specialist in his own field of inquiry. For example, a tiger seldom enters the water to attack the alligator. But if the alligator is on the shore, a hungry tiger would attack the alligator, but he doesn't enter the territory of the alligator, however hungry he is. This is the theory of observability of nature, and which is also true in real life. Lengthy cross-examination of such witnesses is disastrous, or the argument would be, in spite of extensive cross-examination, the credit of the testimony of the witness would not be broken. But if at all the opinion has to be challenged, then the cross-examiner has to research all the authorities and treatises on the subject, and only then attempt to establish that the opinion of the expert could be erroneous. How does he do that? You must understand the theory in which you are operating before you put your theory into practical application. That's common sense. So as we all know, there are five elements regarding expert opinion. Firstly, the person giving the opinion must establish that either by qualification or experience, he's an expert. So you can put your cross-examination on his credit of being an expert. What are his qualifications? And if he says, I'm by experience, how many types of cases he's dealt with? What is the extent of his opinion? Second of the five principles is, he must establish that the subject matter of his opinion has been recognized by the peers as a subject matter of special knowledge. If you would see, fingerprint, thumb impressions as a field of specialized knowledge came from the law of probability with the empirical facts when data of millions of people's thumb impressions were taken, then experts found that by the law of nature, there can be at best 21 ridges on a thumb. And all of us don't have 21 ridges on our thumb. Somebody would have three, somebody would have four, somebody would have five, somebody would have six. Very rarely, somebody would have seven. And these 21 ridges are at a particular place. Do you know the probability of two persons having two ridges at the same place is one in one lakh. Of three ridges in the same place is one in 25 lakhs. Of four, one in two billion. That is why you would see experts say that a good fingerprint sample is where five ridges are picked up. Why? Two people having five ridges at the same place, the probability is one in 10 billion. And when this theory was evolved, the world population was around 2.5 billion. So it was improbable that of five ridges, 
two persons would have them at the same place. So this is the theory which the expert must know behind the expert knowledge, meaning thereby the second limb is that the witness must establish that peers in the field recognize what he deposes to as a subject matter or special knowledge. Thirdly, he must bring out that the peers in the field of special knowledge are in agreement that a theory is evolved which forms the basis of the application of the specialized knowledge for how has he deducted the facts? The witness must bring out how he has applied the theory to the facts to arrive at his opinion. And lastly, if the theory recognizes a known rate of error, he must also bring out in his opinion that he has factored that known rate of error. You know, ty typescripts were recognized in India for the first time as a field of specialized knowledge in 1996 by the Supreme Court. And we have only one judgment on the analysis of a typescript in that infamous case where a ex-army brigadier, brigadier retired, I would like to name him, had uh, was charged for murdering a very well-known industrialist in Delhi. And the motive was that he had stolen his love. And over there, the typescript was produced as evidence and I dealt with the judgment at the appellate stage to bring out the manner in which such an expert testimony needs to be seen. And we said that the witness had not to be believed because in his opinion, the known rate of error had not been factored in by the expert. So put it in a packaged form, there are five elements to expert witness testimony. I won't renumber them again. So the cross examination has to be directed towards. One or more or all, all of them so that the trial of the fact is able to understand the purpose. Since we had agreed that we should have a lot of time for cross examination and it would not be a very theoretical boring lecture. I could end with some general tips. Cross examination cannot be conducted in a manner which elicits evidence that is inadmissible or irrelevant. Next, cross examination which invites hearsay evidence cannot be permitted. Third, if a party wishes to pursue a line of cross examination, relevance of which to the proceedings is not immediately obvious, the party should be called upon to first establish to the court the relevance, and that is that example which I gave you. Fourth, cross examination by asking witnesses to provide information or give an opinion which they do not have or are not qualified to give has to be disallowed. With the exception, it is permissible to ask witnesses who are laypersons to give opinions that is within the realm of common knowledge, such as, well, according to you, how old was that gentleman who was signing as a witness to that document? Or, well, at what speed do you think the vehicle was uh, being driven in a case of accident? So when we say that cross examination cannot be directed where the witness is asked to provide information to give opinions which they do not have or are not qualified to give has to be disallowed is subject to this exception which I have just now referred to. And finally, 
misleading, confusing questions, causing harassment, questions which are intimidating, questions which are humiliating, questions which are offensive, questions which are belittling, questions which are insulting or inappropriate have to be disallowed. One more and then I end. Cross-examination of a child witness has to be on different parameters. While cross-examining a adult witness, it is permissible to rephrase your question on the same fact or the same facet which the witness has deposed to for the reason the same question posed from different angles would elicit responses where from the credit of the witness can be questioned, but this has to be disallowed for children. The reason being children are innocent and instinctively, if you ask on the same issue a question, they tend to believe that their first answer was either wrong or it was an in, uh, imperfect answer and then they get down to correct themselves. And the child specialists and child psychologists agree on that aspect of the matter. Therefore, where you have a child witness before you, the judge has to disallow a repeat question using different physiology on the same set of fact with the witness has deposed to. And um, I promised to complete it in an hour. I have overshot it by five minutes out of which two minutes are to the uh, you will debit to the account of Mrs. Singh and uh, Mr. Yalagada. But I'm sorry for uh, having wasted three minutes of your precious life. But uh, as we said, no human being is so exacting. Thank you. Sir. Uh, Yalagada, sir, your mic is muted. My mic is muted? No, sir. No, sir. Yalagada, sir, mic is muted. I think he will take the questions. He will post the questions yes. to you now. Thank yes. you, sir. I think I'm audible now. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Chetan. Uh, Lordship, uh, at the end, your honor has uh, mentioned what should be allowed and disallowed. I'm starting with the same questions. Uh, there are two, three questions pertaining to section 149 and 150 of the mm. Evidence Act. Yes. First part is, uh, what is the distinction between uh, irrelevant questions and unreasonable questions? And, yes. sec and second part is, uh, what may be the good grounds uh, to hold that unreasonable questions so as to report under section 150. And lastly, uh, curious question, what is contemplated by the High Court once that reporting is done, reporting about the educatism that is done by the trial court? Hmm. Now let's put it irrelevant and unreasonable. I think in my talk I have brought out that and I listed out that irrelevant and inadmissible would be questions which are not related to the facts in issue or the relevant facts deposed to by the witness. I've also brought out the reference to that illustration which I gave that at first blush, something may appear to be an irrelevant, but when called upon to explain, meaning thereby on the irrelevancy of the questions being put. After all, the judge is a person with some kind of an experience. And so many times we understand by instinct as even common people hmm, don't talk irrelevant things. And the biggest example of don't talk irrelevant things is to be found in your house. I think at least once or twice a day, a husband tells the wife or the wife tells the husband, no, don't talk irrelevant things. 
is something like this you're having a party in your house hmm? and you keep on chasing your wife should i wear this blue pant or should i wear this great pant she said look aren't you saying i'm busy cooking don't ask me relevant questions you're intelligent enough go and wear what you want so what i'm just trying to give, give from this illustration is that irrelevancy of questions can be determined very easily because if the witness and if the judge is following the trial he would understand that this particular witness has not deposed to direct evidence of facts in issue he has deposed to certain facts which are relevant which would be used as cobs and um, uh, pins to tie up the main story and then he can understand that when it comes to unreasonable uh, questions now what would be unreasonable question a question which has no reason hmm? reason let's take a simple illustration so i would say alaga da i have reached your house at about 11 o'clock in the morning and uh, you said uh, and you are having a late breakfast and you would say join for breakfast I I had my breakfast in my house, and then you say, uh, "Have a spoon of poha." I said, "Okay, doesn't matter. I'm giving you social company." And then you say, "Why don't you eat a double egg omelet as well?" I would instinctively react by saying, "What? Don't be unreasonable, Mr. Yalaga. Didn't I tell you just now that I've taken my breakfast?" So with this example, we can understand that when you talk of uh, unreasonable questions. now it would be like this let's take a question of an unreasonable this thing the witness deposes that i chased the assailant and caught him 200 meters down and the question to him is do you go for a jog in the morning how do you test your stamina did you win a prize in the school at the race did you participate at the school sporting events these are unreasonable questions why because experience tells us that even a 40 year or a 50 year or even a 60 year old person can make a dash for 100 meters he can make a dash for uh, 100 meters suppose the next question is that look here the assailant was an athlete i put it to you that he is an athlete and you say well i don't know is all right i put it to you he was an athlete and he outpaced you three times why did you still chase him for two minutes well this would not be unreasonable because the witness can then answer and this is where we said how much to cry the witness would say as long as he was in my sight i ran not to catch him but to guide others to catch him I was yelling, "Pakro, Pakro is sad. Catch the man with the red sweater. He has hit somebody." So I ran to give warning to others, in the belief and hope that there are good smartens around. So these questions cannot be answered theoretically. That this is the theory for a irrelevant evidence. This is the theory for an unreasonable, but irrelevant. Yes, there is a theory. i have just brought it out in my lecture and unreasonable you will have to understand by instinct thanks my lord uh, next question pertains to the court witness my lord question is uh, whether a person summoned under section 311 of the code of criminal procedure can be declared as hostile and related question how it can be done when there is no previous statement of that witness and one more question pertaining is that can the parties cross examine such a witness when that person was summoned as a court witness yes now let's understand that the law of evidence has got nothing to do with criminal trials or civil trials it is common to both people generally believe that declaring witnesses hostile is in the realm of criminal matters forgetting that the law of evidence does not draw this distinction at all previous statements come by way of a added protection to an accused in the form of 161 statements why 
because the mighty state is pitted against the individual. Society thought it better that such an accused should be given an additional protected layer. But in civil matters, we don't have previous statements. We don't have any previous statements. So let's understand that. At the first year, there is no concept of a previous statement and therefore you are handicapped at cross examination because in civil trials there are no previous statements and yet witnesses are cross examined. Previous statement is a layer of protection to the accused only recognized by the criminal procedure code and not by the evidence side. So therefore every witness can be subjected to a cross examination even if the witness is a court summoned witness. Now, having said that, what has to be a practical? People don't have good language skills. Apparently, a witness is unable to explain fully what the witness intended to say and what you find are gaps. This witness is not a hostile witness. I've seen a criminal trial. The witness is declared hostile just for the bunkum heck of it, if I may use that expression. He's not stating. Law permits with the permission of the court to even put a leading and a suggestive question to put the witness at the correct place. But let's take the court in its wisdom on the belief that the witness would not perjure himself has been called upon as the witness. And as we know in India and world over money power. The witness has been purchased. The judge has taken a bank. But as we said, every trial. Is a voyage of discovery. In which truth is the quest. Therefore, such a witness. Can be cross examined by now since he is a neutral witness. Obviously he would be cross examined by the party. By whom he is giving damaging evidence and then depending on what he answers, it would be treated akin to an answers given by in cross examination of a normal witness to be re examined by somebody else and then further cross examined on that. Law doesn't prohibit it. Uh, thank you, Lordship. Next question related to section 165 of Evidence Act. Mm. Uh, question is, uh, what are the limitations for a judge to put questions under section 165? And second, when should the court put such questions to know the truth, that is to do the justice? Because uh, your honor you aware, is aware that when the judge puts such questions, there will be allegations that uh, he is filling up or he is helping this side or that yes. side. Yes. Now, the as they say, the role of a judge is that of an empire. I would modify it, but according to me, the role of a judge is not that of an empire. It is that of a referee. Yes. An empire is in cricket who stands at one place. A referee at a football game and a hockey game runs in the field along with the players. Why? To see that they haven't made a foul. To see that there is no offside and he has the help of two linesmen as well. But he is not supposed to start to dribbling. So firstly, with this example, the judge must know that he is like an empire in the football field. He doesn't stand like the, he's like a referee in a football match. He's not like an empire in a cricket match because he doesn't get the help of stump mics. He doesn't get the help now of multiple cameras where there is another one, another referee who would review it. So he runs along, but he doesn't dribble. Having said that theoretically, it would instinctively tell you what is the role of the judge. 
if the witness is not stating fully, he must put questions to elicit further information and not of the nature of a cross-examination. That art the judge must develop. He must ask supplementary questions which would show that he's not started dribbling the ball. And he's only asking questions which are eliciting further information. 161 has been given to the judge. Why? Because ultimately, as I said, every trial is a voyage of discovery in which the truth is the quest. So train yourself to use simple, as we I said in that example, cross examiners, Christian ability, soft, simple questions. Questions which elicit further information and not are and are not combative questions. Thanks a lot. Now one question is on exclusive, probably civil side. Are, are under section uh, cases under uh, section 138 of the Negotiable Instruments Act also. Examination in chief is nowadays presented by way of affidavit. Uh, in civil cases, it may be possible that uh, it is ex parte. The defendant did not appear. The general question is, uh, is it uh, whether it is necessary for that deponent to enter the witness box to say the formal things that this is my affidavit, it bears my signature, to make it as examination in chief, though it is an ex parte. I will, I, I, for the clarity, I will remove that ex parte, my lord, this is a confusion, even in contested cases also, even in 138 NI Act cases also. You don't formally tender it. Now let's understand that the requirement of the law and the law says that examination in chief can be tendered by way of affidavit by way of evidence. So once the law says that examination in chief can be tendered, so the affidavit is the tendering of the examination in chief. The witness has to come to the court and say, I'm tendering it. He must say that. Having said that, at an ex party trial, there would be no cross examination. So we must draw a distinction between a material irregularity and a non material irregularity. And law says that until and unless a irregularity is material, that it hits at the very foundation of what it was supposed to preserve, other irregularities have to be overlooked. So I would answer it practically if it is a ex party case, there is no question of somebody being there to cross examine the witness. The judge may just take it on record. It would be a irregularity. Now, in a case which is contested, the witness statement that I'm tendering it, even if formally not taken, but the witness has to subject him to a cross examination. So the, if the witness is there for cross examination, in my opinion, it would still continue to be a non material irregularity because there is nothing sacrosanct about that part of it. Hmm, that I have not tendered it. Now let me take it a little uh, further. How many witnesses, uh, uh, deponents of affidavits actually go to the oath commissioner? Hardly any. 99% of the affidavits which I have seen as a judge always have that little cross or a tick mark. Can't you know? It was sent to the witness at his house with a tick or a cross. Please sign here. So those questions, were you there before the oath commissioner? Where was the oath commissioner's office? Was he on the ground floor? How old was he? Did you see this and that? Though relevant, but over the period of time, we've started accepting the ways of the life. Thank you, Lordship. Uh, uh, this is regarding this question is pertaining to a practice in different states. Uh, I can give you one example. In Maharashtra, there is no practice of taking the signature of the witness on the deposition. But in some states, there is practice of taking such signatures. But the question by the participant is, 
uh, after the cross examination, if the witness states that the evidence was not recorded as per my uh, uh, deposition and therefore I will not sign. So what can be done at that stage? Well, uh, let's put it like this. Don't you after the witness has deposed and it has been transcribed. It's always written on this side R O A C read over as correct. I saw in Maharashtra also the ROAC was written. Yes, sir. So if you write ROAC, it means what? You have read it over to the witness and he has said it is correct. So if you have actually supposed to do it and you have also recorded ROAC, then I think the judge should also have the signatures. But now the problem. You know, Mr. Yalagara. The truth. The truth is the Steno who has typed the examination in chief and the printer may not be working in the court because read over is correct. The judge doesn't reread it. You hand it over to the witness. You hand it over to the witness and the witness and the lawyer of the witness. Say yes, it is correct. This exactly reflects what I was saying. So what happens is that uh, your printer is not working. And then you have uh, tendered the witness for cross examination also. And at the end of the cross examination, you obtain the signatures. Now we have to blend realities of life. With the requirements of justice as well. If at the end, if the witness says after being crossed that look in my examination in chief, what has been recorded is with a slight twist or this word has come, I didn't say. The judge should be honest to himself because he exactly knows what has happened. And he should take a remedial measure there and then. So answering the question in a structured form, since you write ROAC, so you have done read over as correct, you please take the signatures. But if for some reason of this kind it has not happened and the witness take, uh, states it is not, take corrective action as per your recollection and record truthfully that the printer was not working, it couldn't be read out. But a good practice to be followed and when I did trials in the Delhi High Court as a judge, nowadays you can shift the computer screen you can put it at an angle where the judge can also read what is being typed. The lawyer can also see what is being typed. The witness can also see what is being typed. So the ROAC is coming. Question by question, answer by answer it comes. So you can use that. Uh, Raship, a very important question. Uh, now, uh, child witness, how to ascertain the competency of a child to depose as a witness? Well, this has got nothing to do law. It has just got to do with some common sense. Normally we find that if you see the penal court said that a child less than six years can never be attributed any mens rea. So this tells us that empirically we realize that uh, children who would be infants and infants is till the age of five, you call them, or a child, you call them an infant. It is tough for infants to uh, uh, recall events. So you must draw the distinction if it is an infant, because there may be a case where the husband has murdered the wife in the house, and a four year old child is the only witness. It's at three in the night. So when you say that understanding, you must. Put questions to that child, keeping in view the age of the child, the background of the child. Now let's take a five-year-old child, just an infant. He's in court. So how do you test the intelligence of a five-year-old child? Aapka naam kya hai? What's your name? So and so. Where do you live? He will say, you, wouldn't, you don't expect him to give the address. 
I live with my, I live in a house. <laughs> you have a brother or? Yes. Is he elder to you or is he younger to you? He says elder to me. Do you play with him? Yes. Do you have a sister also? No. Or suppose actually he doesn't have a sister. He says yes. The judge would understand. There's some elder around in that vicinity. Jisko wo didi bolta hai. So you have to put questions at that level. Let's take a child seven years old. Hmm? Ask. What's your do you go to school? Yes. For how long you've been going to school? Three years. The student over class, class two. The judge should know what is taught in class two. Hmm? Two plus two kya hota hai? Bole char hota hai. Bole two multiplied by two kitta hota hai, bole wobi char hota hai. Bole two plus three panch hota hai. Two into three che hota hai. Bole then if two plus three is five, two into three is six, how come two into two is four, two? That, that's not permissible. And the child is not so much understood about those geometrical progressions. So the judge should also use his head. Unfortunately, Mr. Yallagada, what is happening is that a lot of evidence is being recorded by the elders of the court. A lot of evidence. The judge is so busy. He says, let me hear arguments. The steno is doing it. <laughs> but if you're making your steno do it, but tell him, look, you also use. But if you have to do it, I always say, hmm? cheat in a rational manner. Hmm? Don't be stupid as a cheat. A cheat who is rational doesn't. Let's take if I cheat Mr. Yarla Gada of two rupees. Society is not affected because two rupees remains in circulation, eh? not through you, but to me. But if I cheat you foolishly and make you throw that two rupees in a well, then society loses because two rupees is gone. So when we understand in that particular manner, so you must put questions to a child witness. Keeping in view the age, simple questions, and then to understand whether the witness is understanding. Now, for example, you are showing a Lamborghini, and the child is from a rural area. He understands he's seen a car, he normally sees a small car and he sees a bus. He never seen that. The guy will be utterly confused. Uh, it's larger than a car which he sees, is not as big as a bus which he sees. The poor guy will be confused, but uh, but a guy in the town, uh, a smart guy, uh, Lamborghini, it's a Lamborghini. Hmm? You must understand that. So you show a child from a rural area a sickle, he will say it's a sickle. But you show it to a child in an urban area, he's a, then he, he's a, I don't know, he's a, it's like a question mark. He says this is a question mark. Hmm? To If you ask somebody, a child, Ghar mein kapre kaan dhota hai? who washes clothes in the house? A silly guy will say washing machine. The guy in the village will say my mama does it. But nowadays maybe somebody would say in the days of lockdown, papa does it. <laughs> so as simple as that, use your common sense. Go down to the level of the child. Remember your childhood. And that's where I started in the beginning. We've lost our own life because we forgot what we learned as children. Reduce yourself at that level, having said that one, to understand whether he understands and on cross-examination also. Make witnesses draw pictorially. They can do very well. I did a case in Delhi where a child witness, the truthfulness was, you know what she said? She said when my father would leave for work in the night, he would return early morning. So my mother used to just put the latch. On the hook. And as a judge, I understood what she was saying was the old kinds of latches where you have the chain. And you could understand that why she did it. When the father would come back. All you had to do was gently uh, three, four times uh, push the door. And as the tension in the door would get transmitted to the uh, as a vibration where the latch was being hooked on, 
it would fall off. The trial court judge was a very good judge. To understand the topology, so he just gave a sheet to the child and told that seven year old child, can you draw your house? The child exactly drew the latch. So you have to be innovative, but one thing keep in mind on the same fact, repeat questions to be disallowed because a child thinks that probably he's not answered it correctly. Uh, lots of related question. Normally, two questions are asked to child witnesses. One is, do you believe in God? And second, do you know what uh, what will happen if you speak a uh, lie? So what is its relevance and its uh, influence? Look here. This law of cross examination and evidence gets its origin from the later part of the 14th early part 15 moving into the early part of the 16th century where society was small and was homogeneous it all originated in uh, england where people used to attend church where if you had fallen sick the faith healer used to be called you had no sociologists, you had no psychologists. So people who would fall in depression. Uh, faith healers used to call. The priests used to come to the house, read the Bible, explain the will of the Lord. So prevalence of God was so much. But and therefore it traces its origin relevant to the time. Then. So now let's accept things have changed. Science has grown. In how many houses do you have a daily puja? I'll be truthful. I don't do it. I just believe that uh, God is duty. If I perform my tasks every day and I do it honestly, I, I'm a uh, uh, service provider to society. So that's my God. So therefore, in today's circumstances, jhoot bologe to kya hoga? Hmm. Smart witness bolega, neta banunga, prime minister bhi ban sakta hoon. Yes. Lordship, next question, related question. Probably it can be a topic for a webinar itself, but uh, the question is related, therefore I'm putting up. Uh, what precautions must be taken while cross examining a child, especially in POPSO matters when it is a hostile encounter and the court atmosphere is child friendly? Yes. Now, cross examination of not only a child witness, any witness on a matter of sexual assault is a very, very difficult exercise. You remember Mr. Yalagata when I was at your Judicial Academy? Yes, my lord. I had done a session on POSCO. Do you remember where how I started? Yes, my lord. Yes. For the benefit of the audience, we had senior judges there. I told them that I asked them that uh, how many of them were married. I think all except one raised their hands and said we are married. I told them that I am leaving the lecture hall for 10 minutes. I told them to pick up a sheet of paper and a pen and briefly write in about 100 words in 10 minutes. The last. Sexual escapade they had with their spouse. I walked out of the room. I came back after five minutes and all were sitting non pulsed I asked them. Why aren't you writing? That I've asked you to write something in person. I said you can't do it. It's so personal. 
as judicial officers, you couldn't write it. How do you expect a victim of a sexual assault to recap the assault? And we all agree today that telling somebody to recap a sexual assault is to relive the assault for a second time where the trauma is much more. But still, it is the requirement of the law. So the first thing we have understood, we have child friendly courts now. Where the tormentor is not face to face with the child. It's like a video screen. The child cannot even see the face of the tormentor even on the screen. He is secluded. The judge can moderate the question. It's a very, very delicate, delicate task. And the only way forward is that judges who deal with sexual assault cases should be made to undergo at least a 10 hours training with experts in the field. They would guide that in what manner such uh, witnesses need to be dealt with, but few tips are still there. You have to make the witness as much comfortable as you can. You can never make the witness such a witness 100% uh, com comfortable. Try and remove the adjectives from the questions. Because it relates to an event. It would then relate to a verb. A verb is a doing word. So as far as possible, all the adjectives which are uh, woven along with the verbs by the person who's putting the uh, questions to the witness to be removed. And the moment the judge sees that the child is becoming uh, a little uh, discomfortable um, to give uh, a break. And I think the best thing is that never have the examination of such witnesses other than in the presence of a child expert, a person who understands child psychology. Law requires that. Your answer would be that where does the state provide for it? But the answer is it is the duty of the state to provide. You must always ensure that a child psychologist is present and the, uh, the, the child should also be in the presence of any person, preferably a mother in whose lap the child finds comfort and safety. Thanks, my lord. Uh, I may point out, uh, I may, I recollect my lord, uh, to the batch which your honor has referred. Your first question was, uh, I will give you a question. How much time you need to write uh, 75 words or 100 words? Mm. The judges said that uh, hardly 15 minutes. But later on, your honor has disclosed the question. You have to describe your first encounter. Then the, everybody was turned. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now related question is, uh, my lord, uh, in the context of Indian law, Section 164 of the Code of Criminal Procedure permits recording of the statements of the witnesses during investigation by the magistrate. But they are not, those statements are normally not treated as evidence in the trial. The question is why can't such statements of a minor rape victim in Pokso case be treated as examination in chief? The answer is very simple. I have been saying that again and again, though this is not relevant to what we are talking today. It is for society to determine the rules governing decisions. So if society through the legislature enacts the Indian Contract Act, the judge has to live with it. If society through the legislature says, let 100 guilty be let free, but not one innocent. 
be punished. If the society set the norm, the judge has to live by that norm. So what we say is if this is called the policy of the law. Until and unless there is a legislative uh, change. Hmm? We have to live with it. But let me give you a reason as to why the legislature is not doing it this way. In India, we have a lot of problems. Now let us take. The. The witness is a vegetable vendor. On the handcart. Don't we know that such witnesses are susceptible to police pressure? Don't we know that in certain cases there is so much pressure on the prosecution to uh, solve a case? I've seen cases of conspiracy. And let's take the example when the parliament got house got attacked. So much was the pressure. Yeah, unbelievable. Within two days you solved everything. You found out who were involved in it and everything. Not possible at all. They say Yalla Gada. Every confession and a disclosure immediately the man is arrested and within seconds the disclosure and the confession is recorded. Are the accused in India so scared of the police that on seeing the police they said I learned that you have come to catch me so I prepared my statement here it is. I'm sorry it doesn't happen like that. Therefore it appears that the legislature is also aware of these facts. And that is why they are not giving the status to 164 statements as statements made on oath. But it relates to the policy of the law, simply put. You have to live with it. Thank you, my lord. Next question is uh, relating to the again actual control of the cross examination. Uh, the cross examination. Uh, sometimes so is used as a tool to delay the recording of evidence how to deal with and secondly can the court put time limit when such misuse is being done by the advocate can the can the court put some time limit for completion of the cross examination and can the sometimes the cross examination lawyer will uh, insist the uh, witness to answer in s yes or no but if the judge intervenes there, then there will be uh, some ho hostile situation and how to avoid that situation. Well, the answer I have already given when I was talking about it, which are the provisions which empower the court to uh, regulate uh, examination uh, cross examination. Now, yes, you have big problems. The lawyers are virtually taken away the trials. That day we discussed it when I was discussing on appreciation of evidence that what happened at the Bailey trials and how the advocates came in. And uh, now when he says you would answer yes or no. Well, it is for the judge to see. <coughs> what is the question? And logically tell that this question is incapable of being answered in yes or no because the question may have an insinuation behind it and we always have this example. You tell the you ask the witness, have you stopped beating your wife? Answer in yes or no. <laughs> so this question presupposes the supposition that he beats the wife. So if he says yes, I stopped beating, it means he admits that he in the past he used to beat and he says no, it means that he continues to beat. So the judge must train himself that look, Mr. Counsel. This question is based on an assumption. And therefore this question is incapable of being answered in yes or no. <coughs> the judge must look at the question clearly. And in spite of a question being of a kind which can be answered in yes or no, you can tell the lawyer that look, you cannot force a witness to answer. He is not answering it fully. Note it down. Argue at the stage of arguments that look, I put this question. The witness was evasive and therefore the credit of the testimony of the witness has to go. Now what has started happening is lawyers indulge in arguments with witnesses. 
do not, and I had brought out in my lecture that the cross examination is not a argumentative duel between the cross examiner and the witness. Uh, Lordship, next question is uh, in criminal cases, many a times it happens nowadays, a witness is produced as a punch witness. Punch witness means a witnessing a proceeding of a spot inspection or recovery, something <laughs> like that. But during the cross examination, the defense uh, wants to show by cross examination that he was not just a punch witness, but a witness to the incident also. And the prosecution will be having no clue how to deal with and probably that witness will remain like that. How to deal with such a situation? Well, let's put it like this. The theory is this, that if a witness is a witness to the incident, he would have some kind of an insidious bias to prove his truthfulness and therefore could also lead himself to stating things which I had brought out in the earlier part of my lecture. A good prosecutor, a good investigating officer should not include a witness to an incident as a punch witness. He must know that he is now opening the flanks of his witness because this witness would not like to be labeled as a perjured witness. But having said that, you can't throw out lock, stock and barrel. The testimony of this witness is a punch witness. But as we said, common sense guides a lot. Suppose the witness says he's a witness to a robbery. And he says, I saw this man accosts the woman apart from the victim being the witness herself and he snatched her chain, took out the knife, made her remove her bangles as well. And then he ran in that direction. I also ran in the direction and that direction led to a crossing. And from the crossing, the road formed a Y. One road led to colony A, the other lead led to colony B. This guy ran towards colony A. I couldn't chase him and I came back and I told the police. So I gave the clue to the police that the accused would ordinarily be living to a, in colony A because he ran towards colony A. And what does the prosecute, the, uh, the investigating officer do? He takes him straight to colony A because it's all happening live. You know, he's not supposed to wait and oh, the judge will ask me this. He's on a hot pursuit. He's on a hot pursuit. So he goes along with him to colony A. And through his local intelligence, he's told that these eight, ten people indulge in these kinds of things. And you know, a lot of intelligence works in such cases. He lines up the guys. He says, this was the guy who did it. And he says, go inside his house. He'll make the recovery there and then. Now see the setting. I think the judge must be smart enough to see the setting and in what setting. But suppose the accused is caught after eight days. And then after eight days, that person is again got down. The prosecution has to be careful. He's a witness to the TIP as well. He's a witness to the recovery as well. The prosecutor is destroying its case that he has shown the accused to the uh, um, uh, to his witness. So what in a nutshell, it's all a matter of common sense. There could be hundreds of thematic settings at a trial. It is impossible to answer them that situation one, this theory will apply situation two, common sense will apply to all. Appreciate it with use of your common sense. Thanks, my lot. Uh, <coughs> continuing the same trend, may, many times it is found that uh, the in cross examination, the lawyer will start or at a, some stage of the cross examination will start. He will pick up every sentence, material sentence of the examination in chief and say, you have stated this in the examination in chief. This is false. 
this is false. He will go on putting like that because his anxiety is that if that suggestions are is those suggestions yes. are not given, they will go unchallenged. He will uh, try to prevail upon the judge, but there it will be wastage of time. Yeah, it is. So a good judge, you say normally I agree with you. If a material part of the testimony is not challenged, then obviously it will go unchallenged. So firstly, a judge must understand and tell the lawyer. You see, unfortunately, the lawyers don't know every statement is not incriminating or not damaging your case. First of all, the problem is either you tell the lawyer that look here, Mr. Counsel, ostensibly this part of the testimony is damaging you. This part of the testimony is not damaging you. But the other side will say you prejudged it. That's the biggest problem how to handle the lawyer. So the best thing is rather than picking up line by line, just record a general thing. I put it to you that every sentence said by you in your examination in chief is false. So put it as the group rather than sentence by sentence and say that ultimately Mr. Counsel, you're satisfied now that I have confronted and you said that every part of it, what difference does it make every line or put it as everything? My Lord, I used to add one or two more words. Whatever you have deposed against the accused so that he can use what is in his favor, he will use and against the accused, he will he will uh, argue like that. True. So that's also as you getting the point situation by situation. Yes. Yes. Next question is, uh, should the contents of a first information report, that is the FIR, be put up to the witness uh, as contradiction to use it by the defense? Why not? Why not? Without if, putting up, pardon? Without putting up those contents to the informant, mm -hmm. can the lawyer, uh, lawyer definitely will argue how, how the judge can? No, uh, the uh, answer is very clear. Sir. The law of evidence says that previous statements made by a witness are relevant and are admissible evidence. And therefore, the law requires that if you are going to use a previous statement made by any witness, be it at a civil trial, be it at a criminal trial, whether it is a 164, whether it is a 154, whether it is a 161, it is a previous statement. And if you intend to contradict the witness, you have to put the witness to that statement to give the witness an opportunity to explain. And please keep in mind, large number of lawyers and judges do not draw the distinction between a omission, a material omission and a contradiction. So a witness while deposing may say something more than what he said under 154. We have case law that see the state of the victim at the 154. Let's take a brother as seen his brother being assaulted. He's traumatized. He's traumatized. He will not give the nitty gritties. But then later on, he will start giving the nitty gritties as well. But they are in the nature of previous statements. And uh, until and unless you draw the attention of the maker of the statement, you cannot use it for the purposes of building an argument that the witness has contradicted himself. But yes, omissions and all as a natural conduct with respect to improvements or non-improvements, that's a different field of argument. Sir, a uh, question is uh, how one would be cross-examining regarding statement in case diary if the same is not recorded separately under section 161 of the code of criminal procedure well law says that a case diary doesn't form a part of evidence but case diaries are always can be used by judges to satisfy their judicial conscience and uh, production of case diaries is not the right of the accused Thank you, sir. Sometimes uh, the depositions in civil cases are produced in criminal cases to show admission. With a, but they may put up or they may not put up to the concerned witness in, in evidence. What will be their evidentiary value? 
nothing same as i said yes sir. it's the same facet it's a previous statement made by a person cannot be used to discredit the person without drawing the attention of the maker of that statement to the previous statements so thank you sir on interesting question that is it happens day to day uh, a document is referred in cross examination the practice is uh, to give it an exhibit number for yes. the purpose of identification mm -hmm. but the question is merely because that is produced in cross and for and therefore it was given exhibit number the other formalities are requirements to prove that the document are dispensed with there are thousands and thousands of judgments that exhibiting a document is not proof of the contents of the document now let's understand what it is it says that contents of a document will be proved by producing the document itself so it would only be if a document is proved it only proves that this document as it is brought is not a tempered with document but doesn't mean that it contents are also there i may write a letter to you which is containing all falsehood but if i prove that i wrote that letter to you doesn't mean that what is written over there is proof but yes the letter would be used like this mr yalada i have visited your house to discuss a deal and i have left a blank signed check with you on returning home my brother tells me what a fool you are look you haven't finalized the sale price and yet you left it with him so i write a letter immediately and have it delivered to you within 2 hours and in that letter i write that i have left a blank check it would be used in the circumstances under which that i sent the letter within 2 hours of the meeting that i protested at the first instance that i have read that you would use but the contents that i indeed left it would not be used so we must draw that distinction people have the wrong notion that exhibiting a document is proof of its contents yes proof of what is written that it is not a fabricated a document but the truthfulness of that is a different domain keep that in mind and i think there are hundreds and thousands of judgments on this yes my lord thank you my lord um, now it is uh, we are aware there are set of witnesses to act as panch witnesses in in police cases normal citizens are not ready to become panch witnesses and in that situation it is also the result that they will turn hostile because they they sign they just merely sign on the documents and they will be turning hostile and how to uh, cope up with this situation <laughs> now listen these are perversions of a system which are incapable of being answered in theory sir so it is very obvious if it is a punch witness what do you do mr yalla lada we all know the truth have you ever seen the recovery memos the signatures are in the same ink and the writings are in different inks what is the normal thing the witness doesn't carry the pen with him the author who draws the punch nama would hand him over his pen how come every signature is at the bottom of a page where the contents of the punch nama is whether it is two lines or it is eight lines but at the same time if this is the way we start punching holes as such the acquittal rate is very high so it will result in all acquittals so the point ultimately is what do we as judges do we look at the surrounding circumstances and booming what it is what is the nature of the recovery what is the time lag between the incident and the recovery is the recovery capable of being planted the problem is the police is taught everything to do it in a copy book manner have you ever seen and in all the cases i've seen 
the witness says that the accused stabbed the deceased in the street people gathered they caught the accused there and then and yet mr yardla letter what is the investigating officer says the weapon of offense must be recovered pursuant to the disclosure statement after arrest he will record that the witness made a disclosure statement that the weapon of offense i hid it in the drain what bloody hid it in the drain he threw it in the drain and then he led me to the drain he pointed out the place in the drain he will make a pointing out memo whereas he has picked up the knife there and then and surprisingly mr yardla nadda this knife when sent to the forensic laboratory also would have the blood stain of the disease when it is thrown in a drain where water is flowing what do we do if you make a catalog 100% of these cases you must have seen it yourself yes the weapon is there na yeah. the husband ha uh, has uh, murdered the wife in the house the knife is in the kitchen the ayu is gone he's seen the kitchen he's seen the knife is picked it from there yet he will wait for the accused to be arrested after 3 days he record his disclosure statement then he led me to the house and pointed out to the uh, table uh, the top of the counter and said this is the knife i used somebody should ask the i were you stupid when you entered the house did you not see a knife stained with blood but then what do we do mr yardlar i have always said that let natural omissions remain yes they are not fatal any judge will understand that this is a human conduct when you tend to fill them up by padding and what happens is at trials a judge by instinct starts understanding this is the truth this is padding and uh, so he knows the padding lord ship uh, probably uh, some of our judgments are also maybe responsible for this kind of situation because uh, we believe uh, we observe that the for recovery for discovery reco for statement of discovery in fact which is under section 161 though falling under section 27 there should be punch witnesses that is our legal notion and second for to show to prove the seizure also there is necessity of a punch witness these are the two concepts which we we emphasize yeah law does not say so it is only that independent witnesses lend assurance to the credibility of the case of the prosecution because let's understand in theory if it is correct to assume that every prosecutor is interested in the conviction every investigating officer is interested in the result of his investigation to that extent they may have not active bias but a hidden bias and towards that hidden bias they may be a little over zealous that is where we said that judges have to be men of wisdom we overlook some very critical cases you know on this aspect we have a very good judgment of the sindh high court now there what had happened was that the investigating officer said that the accused made the disclosure statement while being uh, interrogated in the thana saying that the stolen property he is hidden in such and such village which is his ancestral village uh, in the a uh, field of a friend of his the io says that i recorded it in his disclosure statement then you also prove the uh, what we call in the northern part of the uh, country as the uh, rose namcha of ravangi that they have left hmm? so he made that entry that they took the police jeep and they left the police station at such and such time then he deposes that the recovery was actually not made from that village it was made from another village but while deposing he says that as we were proceeding to the village which was disclosed by the accused we found that the culvert was under repair 
and since we were proceeding at the night time, the people were working at the culvert so that they had to repair it uh, to make it somewhat accessible for the people at least to walk past in the morning. So he says that we couldn't cross the culvert. We had to abandon that uh, route and we took a detour. And then he says that when I took the detour, we were moving in the direction to village B. And from there we would have to take another detour to come back to village A. And he said that as we were moving towards village B, I saw that the accused was getting very restless, very impatient. He was getting very nervous. I asked him, why are you nervous? What's your problem? He couldn't answer. He said, as an investigating officer, I instinctively realized that this guy had told lies, that he had kept it at village A. And when we were moving towards village B, this guy thought that this Ayo knows that I have kept it in village B. As they reached village B, this guy is fresh. Uh, confidence couldn't hang on more. He broke down and he said, Darogaji, I'm sorry, I told you lies. I've actually hidden it in village B. This is my village where my in-laws stay. I have put it in the house of my father. See the natural setting. See the natural surrounding. The court believed it. It is not believing a recovery like a pedantic exercise. This witness has said this. This witness has said this. He's turned hostile. He has not turned hostile. The surrounding circumstances that day also on the law of appreciation of evidence I had brought out so well that judges ignored the surrounding circumstances in bombing the evidence. This is, as we said, men may lie, circumstances don't. Lordship, uh, we have probably not touched one as one kind of witness, uh, deep and dumb witness. There are certain limitations in cross-examination of uh, that kind of witness. And uh, one more related question is uh, uh, blind witness. If something is to be put to that witness on which is on a document how to refer to the contents my brother judge wrote as a document it what will be referred is actually the contents of a document yes yes now let us uh, uh, understand one or two things a deaf and dumb witness if can depose through sign language a lot of handicap goes if a deaf and dumb witness has a very poor sign language vocabulary, then you have a huge problem. Still, the judge should be careful that in what circumstances the person became a witness, in what circumstances the witness was present there, and what possibly could have been set to or deposed. These problems you basically find, Mr. Yalada, you have not asked me fully, where the deaf and dumb witness is the victim of a sexual crime. Yes. And that the crime took place could be established by medical examination. So it is only in relation to the identity of the uh, uh, witness, uh, the accused. Let me tell you one thing. The eyes of such witnesses and vulnerable witnesses tell more. If the actual uh, accused is confronted in, before them in their eyes, their eyes, the fear tells. The judge could record that. That this demeanor of the witness itself tells me an unwritten uh, story. So it is again boiling down to a commonsensical approach. You said that about a blind witness. Yes, sir. Now, surely nobody would produce a blind witness as an attesting witness to a will. It would be a sheer act of stupidity. If the blind witness is a witness to hearing a dialogue, then his blindness is not a handicap. I cannot think of a blind witness being produced as a witness to a ocular version because obviously he cannot uh, have. 
he could be a witness to what could be 161 statement my lord 161 pardon 161 crpc statement at the most well he could also be rest gesture that i was present over there and i heard the shrieks <coughs> bachao bachao and i could recognize that voice was of the lady of the shop where i used to go and buy things and i used to talk to her and i could uh, recognize her voice and then she was shouting kallu ko pakdo kallu ko pakdo so you see we must be careful that what is the witness talking about what is the witness talking about it's very difficult to say that how would we talk about a blind witness how are we talking about uh, another witness it would all depend to what kind of facts the witness is deposing to and what were the circumstances of the presence of the witness to the facts which the witness is deposing uh last ship now we are turning to another legal aspect Uh, many a times uh, some questions first one important question is put a witness in cross examination that is i suggest to you that before coming to the witness box you, you were read over the, your police statement and if the witness says yes either read over or gone through whether it makes any difference but question real the two questions were to two persons posed these questions what is the evidentiary value of his evidence if he says yes he had gone through or he was read over my lord may submit that two different high courts have taken two different views on this point one uh, high court said that once it is admitted by the witness that it was read over to him before his evidence his entire evidence is washed out and another high court of course a larger bench or probably full bench to rajasthan high court took a view that no mere that fact would not wash out his evidence so in this situation my lord may enlighten the second view is the correct view for the simple reason as i have said the nature of the aberration must be taken into account to determine what is the effect of the uh, aberration now let's take a carpenter if he makes your chair with one leg 2 inches short you will pay nothing you will throw out that chair lock stock and barrel why because it ceases to be of any utility to you but if he is been a little clumsy on his craftsmanship you may scold him you may at best penalize him by saying that look i will not pay you the wages but you will not throw out the chair does law not permit a witness to refresh his memory by looking at the document so merely because a witness admits to the fact that the witness was made to read the 161 though undesirable because a witness is supposed to depose to facts which he had stated and seen from his memory and not be tutored but even if he is he is not tutored to tell a lie he the only aberration is he has been refreshed with apparently what he said earlier and the rajasthan full bench judgment brings this aspect out mr yalada i firmly believe that there is no law other than one the law of common sense logic and reasoning every situation if you can capture it in the trappings of the situation in which it was apply it and on a logic and reasoning you would come to the correct conclusions now let me give an example A sues B for recovery of rupees one thousand, which he says I gave by way of a loan. B admits that he gave the loan to me, and then says that when I returned the loan to him, he refused to take it back from me. 
and therefore he says two things number 1 he should not be entitled to any interest from the date when i offered to return the loan to him and number 2 he may also argue since i offered to return it and he didn't take it from me he should be now stopped from raising the demand during cross examination this witness admits that yes and this fellow who takes the stand he admits that look when he met me at the bus stop he asked me that uh, return my loan i said i don't have your money when we were sitting in the bus and we were going from town a to town b on the way the coyote entered the bus and when the decoy entered the bus i took out a 1000 rupees and told him now you take your 1000 rupees back and the man didn't take it what would the judge say was it a reasonable time was it a reasonable place to return the money when the decoys are already entered the bus so mr yalla that it's all very simple don't lose logic and reasoning keep logic and reasoning in mind every question which you are putting to me can be answered on logic and reasoning so the witness who was made to read his previous statement was not a tutored witness a tutored witness is a witness who told say this 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 which is a lie he is only said to dekho tumne pehle ye bola tha in the past you had said that i am only refreshing your memory at best it's a case of a witness who's refreshed the memory it's an aberration eyebrows at best it would lead to the eyebrows being raised and not more and not eyes being shut at this witness the eyebrows would drop if the witness has sustained himself on cross examination thank you my lord next question is uh, sometimes it may happen that the investigating officer expired and as per our criminal procedure code uh, that omissions and contradictions which were put in cross examination of a prosecution witness have to be proved by examining the investigating officer who recorded them so how to prove those omission and contradictions if the io is dead well if the io is dead other than the presumption that official acts are presumed to be done truthfully and correctly a judge would have no other means on the presumption unfortunately for the prosecution where the burden of proof on the prosecution is of proof beyond reasonable doubt and not of a proof of a preponderance of probability the judge would then have to see what is the nature of the omission or the contradiction in the statements under 161 this are ways what the witness has finally deposed to now for example if the witness says in his testimony he partly supports his 161 that i was present he partly supports that he saw the crime being committed but he he says i never told the investigating officer that the accused was wearing a red colored sweater this part of the statement he denies the investigating officer is dead he cannot say that look all these though he said that but but if this investigating officer has flashed and he proves and there is not this not this investigating officer is dead but somebody else says that look the investigating officer had flashed and this was recorded in the police control room that the victim has is uh, the that somebody has told him that the accused was wearing a red colored sweater at least this is established through the log and the log being then flashed to the police control vans around that a person has stabbed somebody and he is running away and he is wearing a red colored sweater that is established by a police control room jeep that we also received it look we logged it and we caught this fellow so you see you must not leave things at the theoretical level you must look at other surrounding evidence which comes up and then decide 
the problem is what the judges would do would be somebody would say the io is not there and therefore i throw it out no don't do it at best treated as suspected suspect statements and the same thing can be proved through something else so you don't have to go on to that aspect of the matter at all sir very short question if the accused refuses to give sample voice sample or dna sample whether adverse inference can be drawn but my addition will be what will be the adverse inference <laughs> The Constitution says that no one can be compelled to be a witness against himself. So the courts have recognized that you can admit voice samples and writing samples, thumb impressions, DNAs in evidence. but the accused would have a right not to state anything or hand over anything which is in incriminating to the accused but the case law which has developed in india is this that it would be treated as akin to an omission to answer a incriminating evidence and can supply the link in the chain of circumstances so it would be under the indian law this conduct of not giving would be akin to a situation where the victim where the accused is not able to explain the circumstances you can use it as a additional link we we'll put it in the scale of the evidence against the accused give its probable value whatever you want to give it and um, decide thank you my lord uh, one civil related civil question plaintiff examined uh, there are more plaintiffs plaintiffs examined plaintiff number 1 and another witness whether defendant can call plaintiff number 3 who is not examined as a witness for cross examination no he can call him as his witness and if as his witness he turns hostile he can cross examine him then so you he will have to call him as his witness and let him go hostile declare him hostile and cross examine him and a related question is sir uh, what is the evidentiary value of the evidence given by the witness after declaring him as a hostile prosecution so, declared hostile if a witness is declared hostile obviously the victim has brought upon himself a taint right so you will have to the law only says that a witness who attracts a taint on himself would be subjected to a greater scrutiny and this actually relates not to cross examination but relates to the domain of uh, appreciation of evidence such a witness cannot be thrown out lock stock and barrel but such a witness his testimony can be used to the extent it is corroborated by other evidence he is a tainted witness no doubt but not a witness to be totally discredited and every part of his statement to be thrown out uh, my lord a related question is what is the value of a demeanor of witness recorded by the judge uh, actually question is by predecessor judge demeanor of the witness recorded by predecessor judge yes now as you would have seen that when we are talking in my lecture i brought out that the witnesses who are perjured witnesses and are of low intelligence or witnesses who are honest witnesses but have made exaggerations in their testimony for whatever reason those are the witnesses 
which would show signs of nervousness and other things what we call is perjured uh, what we call is the demeanor now a demeanor is a matter of fact it's a matter of fact so if the judge were to record the witness is answering questions hesitantly the witness is showing a blank look on the face the witness is very restless and is moving around restlessly he has to record that now that is a recording of a fact it actually becomes what a percipient evidence of the judge now don't we mr uh, yarlagada in criminal trials why is the exhibit uh, uh, the thing recovered exhibited it is for the judge to see like he says the knife is you brought to the court the judge also has a look at the knife but some other judge decides and writes the judgment so we are not uh, it is not something new to the court the the it may be a a, a a different species but the genus is the same so therefore it is good evidentiary value if the misdemeanor of witnesses or the demeanor of the witnesses is recorded by a judge who's conducting the trial the other judge can also use it but unfortunately these days i don't find any judge recording a demeanor have you seen any tell me truthfully what the new uh, new and young judges do it uh, now they started doing it maybe after i retired <laughs> i have yet to see any judge in the last 30 years ever recording the demeanor of a witness but yes i have answered your question it can be used uh, in pokso act offenses also my lord so many a times uh, that uh, demeanor is recorded a uh, yes. child witness a uh, child witnesses it is recorded yes my lord yes yes in child witnesses i could draw an exception uh, my lord one procedural question do we need to put exhibit mark on section 161 statement during examination in chief before it is used for cross examination not at all <laughs> not at all um so in, in, in delhi it's never put in maharashtra i saw it was being put in rajasthan i saw it was being put the delhi 161 statements they don't but if the if you confront the witness from parts of the statement then for the identity of the document it is not it is put as a mark it is not put as an exhibited document so that the judge should know that this witness was put this particular paper lying in my file so you just mark it as a document uh, for purposes of identification only nothing more uh, my lord in maharashtra the judges underline or bracket that portion which is put for yes. confrontation that they put that is always put in cross examination you always put statement marked a to a b to b c to c yes sir yeah that is put but i have come across cases where there were three eye witnesses and witness a was put the third the second was put the first so it happens sometimes so it's better to put a mark on it in maharashtra it is in examination in chief it is not exhibited my lord it is only it is not. yes it is in cross only when the io comes that portion is put up to the io ha uh, then it is a marked document yes my lord you see it it mark for identifying the document Yes, don't exhibit the document. Mark it. Uh, my, my lord, one last question. It is not pertaining to the topic uh, directly, but it appears to be a genuine question of a uh, new new advocate. Uh, sorry, new judge. There are two directions. Uh, one in one judgment, uh, Honorable High Court uh, said that in Section 125 CRPC cases, examination in chief can be taken on affidavit, and in later on in another. judgment uh, division bench said that it it, it is uh, allowed 
one is one said that not allowed first division bench said that it is allowed what is to be done the first is a single bench or a division bench single first one is single bench it said that no so simple in the state of maharashtra the answer is very simple if the db has the db view will prevail over the single judges view my lord thanks my lord so uh, answer it legalistically but let us tell you one thing what is 125 crpc is it a trial it is enquiry quasi civil yes please understand it says after holding an inquiry so when we talk of after holding an inquiry why are we bringing in all these technical provisions of trial in it so apart from any other reasoning that whether it is division bench or single bench as i have always said if you do not know the reason for the law you do not know the law go to the reason 125 was supposed to be quick and fast to a destitute person normally women come but 125 doesn't say only a lady can come even a male can proceed under 125 sorry uh, not otherwise in a general uh, this thing i'm not at 125 in general thing a husband can also take a maintenance against the wife but when 125 talks of destitution it talks of a summary inquiry so don't bring in all the provisions of a trial in it don't bring in any provisions it could be on an affidavit it could be on any other means because you are after all conducting a inquiry and you're not holding a trial my lord i may be allowed to put a question yes um my lord might have heard there was a cross examination of uh, 75 pages in a negotiable instruments act and it was yet to be completed when my, when your honor was the chief here this this probably it started from two three judges no judge could no magistrate could complete it 75 pages cross was already recorded so my question is in ni act cases or in any summary trial our code of criminal procedure says that the substance of evidence is to be recorded right three phrases i noticed one is substance of evidence and second is memorandum of substance of evidence in someone's right. case yes. and regular and session cases evidence right but uh, how to control this uh, cross it is a biggest no, question the biggest problem yes in summary cases if you bring in the uh, uh, standard of proof and nature of examination at uh, uh, session trial then you draw the problem for yourself so since it is summary by its very nature so you have to record the substance of the examination in chief and not vote by vote and even on a cross examination in such cases is the point is this the truth is a little different the truth lies here that the lawyer becomes very aggressive he threatens the judge that you are being partisan the judge is faced with a very peculiar kind of a problem he will say all right i will ask this question you keep on writing irrelevant give reasons the judge says back to square one I, what was i doing i was saving time so every question he will uh, put i will keep on putting and i will keep on recording this is the reason of irrelevance irrelevance and at the end do what put a special cost upon him so you are trying to save on time you can't save on time and at the end you land up with the same problem but theoretically if the line of cross examination is asking irrelevant questions hearsay questions all those can be disallowed but back to square one mr yarlada what is very easy to said in theory when it is applied in practice it ends up doing the same kind of damage which it is the damage is what you are saving judicial time the same judicial time gets wasted and all you land up is but we can't help it uh, my lord with this uh, we will conclude uh, with your permission the question and answer thank you i first uh, uh, let us thank uh, the judges who posed these questions thank you very much uh, to honorable judges who posed these questions which made this uh, discussion very lively and uh, i again i put my excuses for uh, those judges whose questions were not directly taken but i promise i say that i declare that we have taken up all the questions only questions some probably some overlapping we have left out we have taken all the questions and uh, with this uh, i come to the 
a very important uh, uh, aspect for, for my uh, from, from my part my lord uh, your honor has uh, elaborately discussed all the aspects of the cross examination and uh, guided uh, uh, our, uh, us the judges how to regulate or control the cross examination and we your honor has also touched the aspect of again the appreciation of evidence which was the last uh, webinar so subject i on behalf of all the participants and uh, our academy and our scc online um, uh, collaborator also i express my thanks to your honor and we will again meet tomorrow my lord thank you very much and uh, i express uh, my thanks uh, to our honorable chief justice and uh, our pattern in chief and chairman of the maharashtra judicial academy and our officiating director for uh, allowing us this kind of uh, experiment of a webinar and i express my uh, gratitude and thanks to all the law chiefs all the uh, judges all the registrar uh, generals and the faculty members of the state judicial academies and all the judges from the abroad also uh, sri lanka and kenya i i am very thankful to all of you for joining us and uh, posing a very lively questions and i express my special thanks to the principal uh, judges from all the all over uh, india who have made arrangements special arrangements in the district courts uh, for screening of this webinar for the benefit of the judges and i express my judges uh, to the district system administrators who have made these arrangements and their staff also and uh, my special thanks to the scc online eastern book uh, company their management um, mr malik and karan malik and their vice president uh, sanjay kapoor and my co uh, host uh, anchor uh, chetan singh shergil uh, thank you very much and i express my thanks to our team also for assisting me and thank you very much to all of you and again we will uh, join tomorrow at 11 o'clock uh, with this i conclude my thanks thank you very much thank you oh. thank you sir uh, thank you sir uh, for tomorrow session uh, we have already posted the link in the question answer section so anyone who has not received the link can click on the question answer uh, section you will receive the link over there you might would like to share this link with uh, your brother colleagues uh, other judges uh, this link would be uh, valid for them as well so you can share them share this link and they can join it. on behalf of everyone uh, i would like to thank uh, our speakers our speaker this is number one sir the yellagada sir and thank you everyone for joining today we'll see you tomorrow for a session on webinar on judgment writing tomorrow 11 am thank you so much sir